Welcome to Government Contracting Weekly, sponsored by AOC Key Solutions Incorporated. Government Contracting Weekly is the only television program devoted exclusively to the competitive and dynamic world of government contracting. A world where coming in second place is not an option, but where principle-centered winning is the only approach. Good morning and welcome to Government Contracting Weekly. I'm your host, Hilary Fordwich. We should all feel blessed to be living at a time when amazing advances in technology seem to be happening each and every day. Today I'm excited to introduce two business leaders who understand the power of technology and the businesses that can be built by harnessing innovation. Our show begins with a conversation I recently had with Steve Chambers, President, Sales and Marketing, and Executive Vice President of Nuance Communications. You're probably already using Nuance products, and Steve will give us his take on their efforts to literally reinvent relationships. After Steve, you'll meet Sonu Singh, the president and CEO of the 1901 Group, which Sonu founded from his hometown of Blacksburg, Virginia. There's a lot to cover, so let's get right to it. Welcome to our segment this morning on Government Contracting Weekly, where we have with us an expert, and particularly this morning, this is going to be a little bit different because Steve Chambers, who's joining me, good morning. Good morning. Steve is uh, the president of marketing and sales for Nuance. So with that kind of background, a little bit different than some of the executives we've had on, it's fascinating what you're doing because you're on the cusp of developments in the communications industry. So tell us a bit about Nuance. Well, I think we're a company that people probably interact with all the time and might not even know it. So whenever you go into your car and you might speak using your voice to set a destination with a navigation system. Um, things like the Ford Sync program. When you talk to your phone and you might say, set an appointment for next Tuesday with John. When you talk to your television, which is another consumer product that for this Christmas season you'll be able to search for programming with your voice. All those activities are really powered by our company, Nuance. We specialize in voice recognition and what's called natural language processing or machines that basically understand what you say behind everything that we do. So we don't really see the word nuance everywhere. Right, it is, it is more behind because we're listening. We're not visibly presenting something to you necessarily. We're listening and then we're taking what you say, turning it into text and then applying some artificial intelligence on it to really try to understand what you mean. So. Which is more sophisticated than just the voice recognition. Right, it's kind of two parts. The first part is voice recognition that has to be incredibly accurate or else you know, it won't work on yes. step two. And step two is really taking what the system recognizes and understanding what you mean. So for example, if you picked up your phone and said, uh, where's Iron Man playing? That sounds like a very easy sentence. You as a human being would know, okay, there's a movie, Iron Man, it's a movie, so where it's playing means is there a cinema near me who's playing that film? You'd know that as, an, as a human because you're processing. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So in much the same way as a human processes, our systems understand that Iron Man is a subject, where is it playing isn't a sport, it actually refers to the location, and you're in the genre of film. So that's, uh, that's a lot going on there. It's more intelligent <laughs> design behind it. Yes, right, right. Yes. And we actually call those systems intelligent systems for just that reason, because they're systems that are trying to understand and help you, give you information that you asked for on your request. So processing of data as well. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's profound and interesting in the consumer space, so consumer devices, phones and televisions, automobiles. But there are also incredible applications, in particular used in the government in healthcare. And in most major uh, developed first world countries, there's a bit of a healthcare crisis going on. I mean, it plays out very overtly in the US. We really contribute to the betterment of healthcare delivery, and that's a fascinating way voice recognition and natural language processing are used as well. So we'll learn more about today uh, what you're doing in the government space. We'll learn more about healthcare and the nuance that you didn't know is behind most things you're doing. So maybe you weren't aware of all the technology that was behind all the voice recognition. What's also interesting about Nuance is that their mission is to make technology adapt to the way we think and we operate, being very intuitive and intelligent behind us versus making us adapt to the technology. So my question is, 
Why haven't all other companies and why hasn't industry followed your lead on that? Or are you glad that they haven't because it enables you to be the leader? Definitely glad that they haven't because yeah. there's an opportunity to be different. Um, I think it's really hard. And in our market, because we're dealing with what you say, and what you say means we have to understand the language you speak. We have to understand if you speak with a dialect. Our software needs to understand all the dialects spoken in the United States, the regional accents. So our philosophy of you adapt to the person. The technology has to adapt to the human being. It's about the person versus forcing a person to communicate differently has to be at the core of what we do. Because if we didn't do it, there's no way anyone would feel comfortable using nuanced systems. And they, they wouldn't dictate their emails. They wouldn't dictate proposals into their word processor if suddenly we said, oh, by the way, the way you normally talk, you can't do that. You need learn, to talk in a special way. Yeah, yeah, that would kind yeah. of defeat the purpose. So it's a little bit our mission and our fundamental view that make the technology conform to the person. And it's also so I'm not sure we'd be successful if we did it any other way. It's not as it's not a visual paradigm where you might, with a new video game, teach people how to use a new controller. Mm -hmm. um, we have to use language, and we don't want people to learn a new language to find that uh, how we can make their lives easier and better. You're going beyond user friendly. You're not even considering yeah. that. You're like making them just adapt. Yeah, yes, and very yes, very often technology. we say it's transparent. Mm -hmm. If we do our job right, we don't try to mimic people, but if we do our job right, you'll feel like you're talking to an entity that has as much understanding and empathy as a human being would. Mm -hmm. And that's when we know we did our job right. You did. Uh, Great. So nuance is really adjusting and going beyond the status quo. You're really changing the status quo. Right. How are you doing that, Steve? Well, in, in some respects, it's because there are populations who are underserved by technology today. Uh, and I'll explain what I mean by that. In other respects, we deliver such tremendous value, economic value, that companies who invest in our solutions tend to do so on a pretty strict cost reduction thesis. So in the first one about how we actually serve populations that, that are underserved today, using your voice if you've had an accident, if you are disabled in any way and can't, uh, don't have mobility to type freely, for example, that's profound. And some of the most heartwarming stories among our customer base are those who've suffered an accident who find a renewed life just by speaking and communicating to the world, particularly in this age of social media, instant messaging, you can meaningfully participate in day-to-day -day life in a way that maybe a decade ago you couldn't, couldn't with our technology. Even a few years ago you couldn't. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, even a few years ago. So there are a lot of inspiring stories in our portfolio um, that would really make you stop and take pause and be thankful, mm -hmm. <laughs> but also be appreciative of the technology and what it can do. On the other side of the equation, on the, well, why would companies invest in this technology? You know, there are certain ways technology has forced us to interact, like touch tone, mm -hmm. like sitting on hold for agents mm -hmm. and listening to endless type of mm -hmm. music, like a physician who has documentation they need to review uh, that's handwritten and very laborious and difficult to decipher given the handwriting. All those things we really solve when used in the context of a corporation delivering automated self-service mm -hmm. or a physician allowing him or her to dictate a patient medical record. So I feel like we've removed the shackles of a lot of other business practices mm -hmm. um, that now we're transforming and reinventing to the benefit of physicians and consumers and businesses. And we mentioned earlier that we get to what you're doing in the government space. Mm -hmm. Uh, obviously for our contractor viewers, you're doing this extensively in healthcare. Right. Healthcare is a major market for us and it's a fascinating set of applications. And I'll, I'll tell you a story that's true and it sounds like it's self-serving because it involves myself, but rather than tell you what it does, I'll tell you how it lived in an actual patient encounter, which was my own. I went to my uh, doctor, he knew I worked in high tech, he wasn't exactly sure where I worked or what I did. And I had my annual physical. And then he came back and said, oh, you're going to love this. Watch, watch now. And he picked up the microphone and he started dictating. He said, patient Steve is X years old. This is, has never been a smoker, things mm -hmm. like that. And on screen, the text appeared. And he said, isn't this unbelievable? I said, wow, that's really interesting. <laughs> How much does this save you? And he said, well, we're on a schedule. We're supposed to see patients every 12 minutes. And it's taxing. And this allows me a quicker transition 
uh, between patients. I can see more patients or sometimes when I really need a break I can take one without feeling as guilty. Well that was nuance. That's turning the physician's voice to text. Such saving that, money, well, saving taxpayer saving money. Saving a ton, ton of, of money, money because all of a sudden all the people who have to, you can really truncate the people who review medical records. The physician can themselves do something called self-edit. If they, so if a physician sees you, the, the uh, time uh, between your, your visit with the physician and the documentations collapse because they'll walk out of the okay. room and they'll start dictating. Yes. So it's not like later on they write down notes and say, oh gosh, what did... And I would, think, I would think accuracy because they don't have to remember anything or hold on to it. Exactly. And, yeah. So there's an accuracy component, there's a quality of physician life component, there's a quality of care manifest in the accuracy of the outcome. And then there's something we do, which I'll stop for a second to make sure this point's clear because the first step is just turning their voice to text and placing it in an electronic medical record, which mm -hmm. is required now via regulation. So Army is a huge user of our product, which is called Dragon Medical, and a number of other areas, Veterans Hospital, for example, use the product for physician documentation. But where it's going is really extraordinary. That, that's interesting enough because it saves tremendous amount of money. And we want to learn where it's yeah. going. <laughs> We're going to learn that in a moment. As all of our regular viewers know, Key Solutions is the force behind Government Contracting Weekly, providing strategy, capture and proposal support services. So we are, and our audience is definitely interested in, why are you winning? Why are you growing? And what I love about your different perspective, Steve, is obviously heading up and being president of sales and marketing, you're really talented and your expertise is this arena. So why is Nuance winning? Why are you beating the competition and what is it that you're offering the government that makes you win? It's a great question because I'd really distill it to two elements of value um, that compel organizations to invest in Nuance Solutions. The first is a very quantified, discernible return on investment. The cost savings are extreme. When you talk about our deployments like at Social Security Administration, when you talk about automated service of uh, residents of citizens of the United States for all the manner of information that goes between the governments and those citizens. The more you can automate, the less citizens need to wait, oh. the fewer times they need to be transferred and sitting on hold taking up network, the fewer times they might need to talk to agents when frankly automation could have answered their question and you could leave agents to higher value tasks. So the first by far is we sell on the costs that we actually can deliver, the cost reductions. And, and it can be profound. It can be profound. And you're in the right profound. place at the right time. Yeah, yeah. Cost reductions in this, <laughs> given, this economy. Given sequestration and given the, the general Austerity proclivities general. of government to want to yes. uh, you know, economize, yeah, we've got a big story to tell there. And it's kind of intangible also that sort of, I would think, um, you know, employee morale, taxpayer morale, where you get service quickly. Yeah, yeah. no, and it's, it's very true because particularly the younger demographic, age 35 like and yeah, yeah. <laughs> like you, age 35 and younger, it, it is a direct correlation between their satisfaction mm -hmm. with the experience of self-service and the speed with which they can get the task done. Mm -hmm. That we can allow people to simply speak freely, say in a naturally phrased sentence what they're looking for and our technology understands them and immediately presents the information, that's the key to not only eliminating a ton of costs, but also delivering a satisfaction to a citizen that they're going to feel, wow, the government's investing technology that actually gave me time back. So a positive feeling about government, which exactly. is wonderful, and that's what the government also wants. So it's about your technology. What about also from your sales and marketing side, what are you doing on the actual proposal process? Because you're not the only firm offering this. That's so true. what are you doing, Steve, to differentiate you in that proposal strategy capture process? Right. Um, let me get to that in one second. I just yes. want to say the other thing besides cost reduction is security because we talked a little oh, about right. voice yes. biometrics. Yes. So everyone's looking to better authenticate individuals, particularly since individuals can come in through the web, they can come in through social, they can come in through mobile, they can come in over the phone, they can come in in person. And they're getting smarter. And they're getting smarter. So the degree to which we can provide an easy way 
to identify and validate who people are through the simple spoken word yeah. is transformative. While being cost effective uh, well, at the same time. And it doesn't yes. require scanners, fingerprint scanners, retinal scanners. So yeah, there's an amazing, amazing cost benefit argument, fraud minimization benefit, and just consumer convenience. The so degree it's a to which combination people, of the two. Right, yes. exactly. Uh, the, how we're servicing the government market is really via partnerships. So those companies who can further our efforts, who are excited about this software, who understand how to sell based on a classic solution sell, meaning understand the organization's goals. Are they economic? Are they cost reduction? Is it experience? Are they trying to deliver a transformative experience through a mobile device? Those are the types of companies I think would partner with Nuance and really see an amazing interest in the technologies. And now our audience is always interested in teaming opportunities, so that's right. great to know. Yes. Right. And so are we. So we have Good. a variety Good. of partners who are GSA contract on schedule and um, we are always looking for more because we work in the field of imaging, voice recognition, natural language, and mobile devices, over the telephone, over the web. So there are a lot of companies in your audience, I'd imagine, who have expertise in those technology areas who also know how to sell on the benchmark of cost reduction and consumer or citizen experience. That's a perfect sweet spot for Nuance. So now you know what to offer Nuance, what you need to do to team with Nuance, and we've learned a lot this morning, Steve. I so appreciate you coming in. Thank you for your time. Thank you for appreciate coming. It. Steve Chambers and his colleagues at Nuance have created a front row seat on the future of high tech. Our next guest, Sonu Singh, has also built a forward-looking company. But interestingly enough, they take their name from a page in history. Let's meet Sonu. Good morning, I have with us this morning a local expert, uh, Sonu Singh, who's the president and CEO of the 1901 Group. Good morning, Sonu. Good morning. And Sonu has a very interesting uh, proposition for the government, and it's also the origin of the corporate name, the 1901 Group. So maybe you can share with our audience where that comes from and the proposition from your company. Oh, sure, thank you. Um, so 1901 was the year the assembly line was created by Ransom Olds. And, uh, we, I worked in manufacturing uh, uh, many years ago, and I always was uh, wondering why we couldn't take some of the same concepts in manufacturing that really transform manufacturing uh, and apply them to IT. Uh, so we established what we call the IT factory, which is a, an IT operations center, and we're applying manufacturing principles, just like they started in 1901, to increase productivity uh, reduce cost and increase quality. Which is also a good proposition for the government today, efficiencies and quality and a lower cost. Yes, yes, that's exactly what we're going for. And, and what we've, uh, we've done is we've looked at in manufacturing, defects drove a lot of uh, issues like high inventory levels, high working capital, uh, extended supply chains, poor quality. And in IT, for IT infrastructure and O&M, uh, unplanned incidents are similar to defects. And so our whole goal is to eliminate unplanned incidents and run our operation center like an IT assembly line. So you are to IT as Henry Ford was to cars. Well, so I they'll talk say, about Sonu Singh and Henry Ford one day in the same kind of <laughs> yeah, sentence. I, I wouldn't go that far, but uh, we're definitely taking some of those principles that he put in place and applying them to a field that was uh, primarily considered uh, uh, very much a, uh, a, a, a what I'd call a job shop versus an assembly line. Uh, IT projects tend to be project based and not process based and we're trying to look at it as uh, a single facility can provide support for multiple clients um, in multiple regions doing multiple different uh, things as it relates to IT infrastructure and O&M. So sort of a commoditization also. Absolutely. Yeah. With the ongoing uh, fiscal crisis and the ongoing debate and budget deadlines and sequestration, the government is somewhat distant from industry. Most people contend, and other people say, no, the chasm is getting smaller and government and industry are coming together. What's your view, Sonu? I, I think government and industry both want the same thing. You know, I, I, I believe they, everybody wants high performance at a lower cost and, and, uh, and the ability to understand what, what you're doing and how you're doing it. Uh, I think government and industry sometimes come at it from different angles. 
Um, I do think that when the in the current environment, as you mentioned, with the sequester and, and the budget battles looming, it is good for businesses like ours. Uh, we're, we're starkly contrasted from the classic IT business, and what we look at in the, uh, in the way that we look at things is, is based on productivity, quality, and lower cost. And we don't believe those are mutually exclusive. And the apple pie issues. Nobody's yes. going to disagree. Yes. I, I, we, we've yet to have someone say, I don't want to do what you do. It's really a how? question of how do we get to that, that, uh, that way of doing business. Well, speaking of how, what about LPTA? Is that going to help or hurt you? In some ways, that should be beneficial. I, I think long term, it could be very beneficial. I, I guess the biggest thing on LPTA is if there's a way to measure, quantify the the deliverable or quantify the service, um, then LPTA can be very good. I think uh, commercial pra uh, industries do it all the time uh, with reverse auctions and different ways. To, as long as it's quantifiable, I and think market the, competition drives it anyway. It's, it's, it's exactly, natural. exactly. I, I think in the government, where some of the objectives or some of the ways to measure performance are more qualitative then LPTA becomes very difficult because if you look at the way the government procures now, which is essentially uh, labor categories and products, products I think you can do LPTA with, but labor categories, it's a qualitative assessment Nuances of who's better. Nuances and complexity and yes, Exactly, and quality, so you have yeah. a big, big, big uh, program and it's all being staffed by bodies. Whose bodies are better? And, um, and is low cost the way to determine that? What we do, since we're delivering a service, uh, a lot of things that we do can be quantified very clearly, like availability, you know, uptime, uh, reduction of incidents. So if we can quantify those, uh, then LPTA for us is very good because it's you know presumably higher quality at a lower cost. So lowest price technically acceptable maybe to your benefit, but also you're an industry leader in terms of many of our viewers can take what you're doing and hopefully apply it to their businesses because it's what the government eventually is is, going, is procuring that way and is where we're being led to. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. In an effort to always provide you with news you can use, we know that many viewers are interested in what kind of teaming opportunities there are. They're watching thinking, how can I work with 1901? So do you look for Saabs? What are you looking for? And what should our audience be cognizant of? Uh, we, we, we'd love working with all different types of companies. We, uh, there's uh, deals where we're the prime and we're looking for subcontractors to fill uh, specific roles around domain expertise. Uh, could be a specific agency, could be knowledge of a speci specific system. Uh, we, we're also sub to other companies in, in larger engagements where we're looking or where we might not have a contract vehicle. Uh, but primarily we're looking for organizations that understand that the model is changing and aren't necessarily wedded to the way things were done in the past. And so we have a lot of situations where we're trying to uh, in, a, in a way change the game board and as long as organizations are interested in working along along those lines we look for those type of companies and those type of people that think that the, the, the trends are driving the government to change and they want to be a part of that change. As our regular viewers know, the force behind Government Contracting Weekly is Key Solutions, and Key Solutions provides strategy, capture, and proposal support services for the winning of government contracts. So we're always interested in asking, and our viewers love to know, why are you winning so new? You've got an innovative model. You have a very different approach. What are the keys to winning for the 1901 group? I, I think it's really a combination. Uh, it centers around our business model, which is, uh, again, starkly contrasted with the classic uh, IT model. Uh, and our business model combined with domain expertise in specific areas or in specific agencies, uh, we believe provides us a competitive advantage relative to the, the classic IT businesses. And, you know, from our perspective, that is the key to winning. Now, of course, if the government doesn't change or doesn't change fast enough, it, 
from my perspective, could be the key to bankruptcy. Yes. Right? <laughs> and the government losing out as well. Not yes. just, not just yes. you. And then also you're in Blacksburg, Virginia, so you have a reduced cost of living, 50% less cost of living there than the Northern Virginia area. So you have reduced costs. Right. Well, and I think our, our reduced cost, again, is, is, is part of the model. The, the real part of the model is how do we do things in a way that reduces the amount of unplanned IT incidents. So the, the analogy would be, um, if there was nothing ever wrong in your IT system, what are all your people doing? Yes. And from our perspective, we don't believe in inspecting quality into the process. We believe in building it in. Um, so what we, you know, if you're just watching a monitor and waiting for something to break, that's uh, orders of magnitude more expensive to the business or to the organization than preventing it from breaking preventative the first time. initially. So we're, we're much more about preventative IT incident reduction versus corrective IT incident reduction. Not saying that we don't do that, but our whole culture is focused around how do we prevent things from going down versus fixing them faster. Which drives inefficiency, drives efficiencies as well. Absolutely, yes. and I think there's a stat out there that it's 50 times more expensive to fix an IT problem than to prevent it in the first place. So you've got a great offering, you've got cost effective, uh, more efficient, and the government just needs to get on the, the, the same track as you are, and then we can all have efficiency. So thank you very much for bringing that innovative approach and coming this morning. Thank you. Should a proposal's executive summary sell or summarize? Okay, we get it. An argument can be made for either technique or both. But unless the RFP prescribes the format to be summarized, we prefer it sell. Here's why. The executive summary is probably the only place in the proposal where a company's entire integrated story can be unfolded. It may be the only portion of the document read by the source selection official and other senior executives. It creates interest and sets the tone for the rest of the proposal. It presents your company's value proposition, solution, and rationale for its selection. It becomes your storyline's golden thread woven throughout the document. The executive summary that merely summarizes creates a disjointed read. Themes and discriminators are scattered. Worse, if you force yourself to summarize the entire proposal, you devote precious proposal real estate to topics with minimal point value. If given the choice, we prefer an executive summary that sells, not merely summarizes. For more information about this and other keys to winning, go to governmentcontractingweekly.com and click on Weekly Buzz. As a leader in next generation technology, CSC values the great insights that are provided by Government Contracting Weekly. been watching Government Contracting Weekly, sponsored each week by AOC Key Solutions Contact Incorporated. Us at AOC Government Key Contracting Weekly com. is the only television program devoted exclusively to the competitive and dynamic world of government contracting. For additional information, comments, questions, or suggestions, please write us at governmentcontractingweekly.com.